I feel a little bit embarrassed to some degree to talk to my 18 year old self. What social media does is it makes us pretty lazy and it creates a particular personality cult. We need to decenter the West from our lives as Muslims. Why have we got this, what you call collective amnesia? Yeah. How do you belong to something which is automatic when you have no memory of it? So they should move back to the Muslim world to give their um, knowledge no. and expertise? There's a collective memory of Islam that's embedded in those people yeah. that is passed down from generation to generation or tradition in the buildings, in the food. I need to learn how to take criticism. When I was that age, I lacked it. I watched an anime called One Piece. Right. In life, we go through ups and downs. We think we know what we know, but upon reflection, we realize through experience and wisdom that maybe there was another way. We live in a world where globalization and its dislocation has widened the gulf between younger generations and those that came before to traverse this temporary world. Yet there is a dire requirement to learn from one another if the Muslim Ummah is to move forward. Today we have back on the show Dr. Yakub Ahmed. Yakub is an Ottoman specialist who is based in Istanbul, Turkey. Yakub and I have often talked and had lengthy conversations about the predicament of this Muslim Ummah and I felt it would be wonderful for him to give 10 pieces of advice to his 18-year-old self. With the Gaza genocide as our backdrop and the feeling that young people want to change the world, what advice can he give to this new generation and indeed to ourselves? Dr. Yakub Ahmed, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah and welcome back to the Thinking Muslim Podcast. Wa rahmatullah. Well, it's great to have you with us. And um, I've asked you to think about 10 pieces of advice that you would give to your 18-year-old self. So this is very much, you know, you self-reflecting and asking, uh, what would I have known, what should I have known more of? What could I have developed as an 18-year-old? Or how could I have developed as an 18-year-old? But of course, by extension, uh, it's really an advice or series of advice pieces to the younger generation. Now, before we begin, um, I sent this topic out to my team and a couple of them were quite reserved about the topic because we at The Thinking Muslim, we've tried to uh, create a podcast where we're not following personalities. It's not about the person. It's about his or her expertise. And we've tried our best to make sure that our viewers observe the depth of content people have. And I suppose their reservation was, are we not then saying that, you know, are we not following that same personality worship, unfortunately, that we see uh, it on social media? And unfortunately, that, that sort of weighs down the Muslim Ummah. Like, how would you, ad you know, address that? Like, what's your take on, on that subject? Because we had a very heated and healthy discussion about it. But how would you respond to that? First of all, I will be in the Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Iza ja Nasrullahi wal Fat. I pray to Allah Ta'ala that Allah Ta'ala protects our brothers and sisters not only in Gaza and Palestine but around the world. For it's from Allah Ta'ala that victory comes and it's from Allah Ta'ala that assistance comes and only then does the opening begin with the hearts and minds of people and I pray that Allah Ta'ala is the one worthy of worship and nobody else. Um, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting point that you make. Um, as you know, I am somebody who doesn't want to be popular in the first place. I I try hard to hide and, 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 and you know, not be driven to having that status. And, and it's very difficult for me to be on these platforms, actually. It makes me very uncomfortable. And one of the things that makes me come on a show of this nature is, is twofold. The first one was, I've had students in the past say that, what would you say to Allah Ta'ala, where you have opinions and thoughts that we want to listen to, and you're shying away from that responsibility. So here, it's not an issue of, of me in terms of my personality per se. Um, I hope not anyway. And I pray to Allah Ta'ala that he protects me from my ego and the ummah from me. But the idea that... Um, there are people amongst the Ummah who have something substantial to say that's important. People who are integrated within the Ummah to a certain degree, which I like to believe I am um, now. And they can part that advice to other people and try to help them out. And that's what we try to do. So there's an assumption that because I'm a historian, 
that I only do history, right? But I'm an educator, actually, first and foremost. And uh, somebody who works in the field of education, um, the, when you spoke with the topics about ideas or wisdom, the younger generation have con are continuously asking me questions about how to navigate life, which they assume that we have found a way of doing once you get to your 40s and I mean, so forth. Just to start for our viewers, yeah. um, I think the other day when I was in Istanbul, yeah. we were walking uh, down a couple of streets in Uskudar. Mm -hmm. And every so often I saw that, you know, younger people, your students or people that you've lectured to yeah. in the past would come up to you and ask you a question. Yeah. And it wasn't really necessarily a question about Ottoman history. No. I mean, so it seems like, you know, uh, and, and I've noticed that with uh, Dr. Heber yeah. in Istanbul, who's from Egypt. And, mm -hmm. you know, of course, lots of young ladies, young girls ask mm -hmm. her questions about life. Yeah. So there seems to be you know, the development of, of, I don't know, an informal mentoring system. It's a prophetic in tradition, right. in fact. Um, one of the things that I've been very reluctant to do is to amplify myself on social media. And I've made this argument that what social media does do, it's a very emotive tool. Yeah. It allows a particular emotion to, to continuously manifest and be visible in the consciousness of people collectively. But what social media cannot do is... Um, maintain a particular um, internalized um, idea, emotions, and sentiment, which only happens by being embedded within people. So Rasul when he gave yes. da'wah, and I always make this case about Rasul yes. yes. that he laughed with the ummah. He cried with the ummah. When the ummah suffered, he suffered. When the ummah were being tortured, he was tortured. When the ummah lost family members, he lost family members. And when the Ummah was a Badr, he was a Badr. In that sense, being embedded in the community um, is very important in the sense of not only being able to resonate with them, but to help them grow. Because what Rasulullah did, and this is my argument, is that for all the institutions we talk about in Islamic studies, about the building of institutions, the most powerful institutions he built were the Sahaba, were people. He invested in people. Because he lived with them day to day. So when Musab ibn Umair, and you and I have spoken about this, went to Medina, Rasulullah put absolute trust in Musab an, to go to Medina and run with it. He trusted the Islam that he gave to him. He trusted his character. He trusted what he did. So that, that sort of like being embedded in the community in that way, I think is important. What's happened, and I think this criticism is, is correct in some ways, is that what social media does is it makes it pretty lazy and it creates a particular personality cult where then people start to subscribe to that personality. Alhamdulillah, I like to believe I'm not that person. That could change, and may Allah, Allah protect me from that. But the idea of, of being embedded in the community and you know, not having that distance and, and being able to resonate with their pain, and especially in the case of Gaza, because I live in Istanbul, we have students from Gaza, and it was very painful for me because there were people I couldn't make eye contact with mm. because of what they'd gone through and their family members had gone through. And as an educator, you feel the collective pain. And you, you, you realize, and, and people will come to you and say, we don't know how to navigate this space. And it's not that I have the answers, but we're going through it together. Now, it's not that I can tell them this is right or this is wrong, but with age comes a particular sort of like, you know, I, I, used to, I spoke to Malik al-Badri, um, he was an Islamic psychologist. Um, he was a very interesting man. Um, mm -hmm. You know, he met Malcolm X and um, Maududi and so forth. And he said to me um, that the way that Allah Ta'ala um, shapes his anbiya is he puts them through life experiences to shape their character. Right. He doesn't need to test them. He chose them. right? But the reason why they're being tested is one, for us to understand. But the two, to shape their character so that when they get to a particular point where Allah Ta'ala expects an objective from them, they have gone through a particular stage. And that's interesting about our culture, the notion of wisdom, right? Which is in the West, I no longer hear the idea of the parting of wisdom. I hear the idea of knowledge itself. But in our culture, wisdom is important. Yeah. And so when you get to the age of myself with a white beard and so on, um, I can understand why the 18-year-old, 19-year-old, 20-year-old is turning to someone like me or people who are better than me and saying, what do we do now? Yeah. Because that's the expectation that, okay, you've, you've navigated this space. And we should be able to help in that sense. Do you find that, um, I mean, I saw that in Istanbul. I don't see very much of that, by the way, mm. in the UK. And I'm a, I was an educator full yeah. time here in, in the UK. And uh, often students don't come to you mm. for, they come to you for mm. the knowledge you are going to impart to them. Mm. And, and of course, anything pertinent to passing an exam. 
but there isn't a a general culture of seeking wisdom from those who are older than you. And to be honest, when I was younger, I probably would not have listened to yeah. uh, to people. I, I, is that a is that a Western thing? Is that a you know w- what's going on there? I'm not sure. I think in the major metropolises there is a particular dis- disconnect between peoples, not yeah. just generations, but yeah. peoples themselves and communities and so on. Yeah. What I learned was that I didn't want to be that person. Right. Um, and I think when you spoke about Dr. Hibber and many others, we've all come to the conclusion that we have to be far more integrated within the people that we're teaching. Yeah. The interesting thing about Rasul Salam, and I mentioned him again, is that he's the walking Quran, right? In that sense, he's not just shaping your intellectual ideas, he's shaping you as a person. This is why like, we talk about the, the uniqueness of the Sahaba in that sense, that he's imparting on them not just knowledge but how to be in terms of people right Mm. and so the prophetic tradition when it comes to teaching and to learning is there's a particular decorum from the student and a particular decorum from the teacher and our job as teachers then is not just to come into a classroom teach and bounce Mm. which is what happens here a lot i am seeing that in muslim societies but that's not the type of person i wanted to be Mm. So I take an invested interest in my students, what's right. happening in their lives, yeah. what are they struggling with, how can we improve them, how can I improve, how can we work together. So I have a relationship with my students that if I make a mistake, I, have, I am more than happy for them to correct me, even though I'm the educator here, right? Because we're a community, we live together mm. in that sense. And when you create relationships and bonds, when it comes to knowledge, that knowledge is internalized far deeper than when it's just something abstract and intellectual. And this is where, I mean, I'm on the podcast and so forth, but this is what the podcast cannot do. Yeah. This is where living amongst the community is important. And if, as an educator, I'm distant from the community, that's a problem. Yeah. Um, so um, now what I try to do um, is, is be as integrated within the community as I can be um, so that I know what's happening in my community. Yeah. Um, so that we can find solutions for them. And right. um, that is the Islamic way. I mean, Jibreel alayhi salam taught Rasul Sallam. Rasul Sallam. Sallam taught the Sahaba and the Muslims. And that is our tradition. We do not write books to be read. We write books to be taught. The teacher is the intermediary and the interlocutor between the knowledge and the book that's being taught in that sense. So the teacher is central. And our style of teaching, our pedagogy, yes. is that we're not just teaching knowledge, we're teaching how to be human. Okay, that's really thoughtful. So I've asked you to come along today yeah. to give me 10 pieces of advice right. that you would give to your 18-year-old self. And you've kindly sent me these, mm-hmm. these uh, you know, headings in mm-hmm. advance. Um, so let's start with number one. Yeah. Uh, you've said that the first piece of advice you would give to your 18-year-old self would be uh, to make the Quran a companion. Yeah. Explain, explain the relevance of that, uh, you know, beyond the obvious, yeah. of course. I mean, look, I, I feel a little bit embarrassed to some degree to talk to my 18-year-old self. Um, I think I was pretty cool when I was 18 and now and I look back at myself, I think, mean, no, I wasn't that person. But, yeah. you know, one of the interesting things I learned now is I wish that my relationship with the Qur'an was better then because it sets you up for what you become later on in life, right? right? And the Qur'an, I said, make it a companion. Now, when I spoke about Rasul Salam, and I've said this before in the cave, when Jibreel alayhi salam meets him, he says, Iqra. Mm. And Iqra doesn't simply mean to read or to recite. It also means to comprehend. Yes. So the first word of the Quran has already determined the relationship you ought to have with the book. Mm. You need to read it, you need to recite it, you need to comprehend it, right? Mm. So the Quran takes its name from the word Iqra, in that sense. And that's interesting for me, because what? Allah Ta'ala says, Iqra bismi rabbika lazi khalaq. So in some ways he's reminding Rasul Sallam but also Insan about who created Insan. Um, and he, he says it's the Rabb, the, the Lord, the one that Rasul Sallam has been contemplated over. And to address that contemplation, he sends him wahi, Quran, in that sense. And then he talks about you know, um, the, the, the need for also teaching knowledge and Allah Ta'ala is the one who taught us that knowledge. Now, what I believe, and I feel this way, to understand your humanity, to understand what it means to be human, you cannot dislocate the one that created you, the Khalik. So, Allah Ta'ala is the Khalik who created Insan. Part of your fitrah is to know who created you. Part of your fitrah is to worship the one that created you. If you reject the Khalik, the one that created you, if you reject the knowledge of the one that created you, if you reject the knowledge of how to worship the one that created you, mm. if you reject that 
any knowledge of how to know that one that created you, if you reject your soul, if you reject the idea of heaven and hellfire, you reject all of these things. You've rejected a part of your humanity because the whole purpose of a human being is to recognize that you have been created by the one that created you. Mm. And this is why we have a soul in that context. Now, if that's missing in you, um, in that degree, it leads to nothing but misery for human beings. Right. The human being is always searching for purpose. And so this is why in Western civilization today, there's a sense of agitation because they removed all of those aspects which are part of your humanity and they reduce humanity to looking inward to themselves mm. and then they're looking for answers. So you get questions like, this is how I feel. This is what I think. This is my opinion. Sense of self-worship. And it leads to some level of agitation. Mm. When in actuality, if you turn to Allah Ta'ala, which is what you've been created for, and the discourse is Allah-centered, not human-centered, then you start to see a sense of liberation in terms of who you are. Mm. The way you do that is to make the Qur'an your companion. Yes. So I make an argument since post-Ghazda is we need to decenter the West uh, from our lives as Muslims because... Right. The level of contamination that has taken place uh, post-colonialism to the point that we've become exceptionally subservient intellectually, yeah. to the point that we're nervous about shifting out of that box. Give and me so, an example of how we send, we make the West a center. Well, everything is about the West. Everything is about what people think in the West. I yes. think even in regards to Gaza, we're turning to the West, appealing to it. Right. In that sense. Yes. And so, in in many ways, um, you know, um, I was speaking to some friends and saying. You know, we were sp I was speaking to Sami Hamdi and we were talking and he said, you know, we need to make the Ummah believe again. The Ummah has agency. And I said, yeah. you're right. But one of the concerns I have is that we have forgotten that Allah Ta'ala has agency. True. What is Allah Ta'ala's agency? There's nobody who has more agency than the one that created us. And so when we speak of Palestine and so forth, the first question I keep asking is what is Allah's plan? What has Allah Ta'ala achieved? What are the veils that Allah Ta'ala has removed? How is Allah Ta'ala providing his support? Yes. And so on. You can see that he ought to be central to that narrative, which makes us different. In that sense, Allah Ta'ala's assistance and the assistance of his deen and Islam itself as an alternative, I believe, I fundamentally believe this, mm. is far more conducive to the human condition than what we're seeing right now, mm. which is the destruction that's coming from a more human-centered approach to the world, in which it's quite secular and it, it dislocates everything. Um, I was reading a book recently, um, and they were talking about Uthman bin Affan and, yeah. and the writer said, you know, and Allah Ta'ala didn't give them the inspiration. Hmm. And I found that interesting and beautiful at the same time, that the writer um, recognized that nothing happens without the will of Allah Ta'ala and put it on the paper. Yes. In that sense, to make your world Allah-centered, there is nothing more... Um, Important than the Quran, his word himself. Yeah. If you read the Quran, Allah Ta'ala says, Alif Lam Mim Zalik al Kitabul Arabi for it. Al Rahman Allah al Quran. Yasin wal Quran al Hakim. Continuously reminding you that once that him and the Quran are synonymous with each other, right? Yes. In that sense. So, in order to understand your Maker and the one that created you, and in order to understand yourself better, who better to speak to than the one who created you, which is the Quran, right? I, mean, I suppose uh, many 18 year olds would sort of would say, maybe we just don't have that level of access to the Quran that we would desire to have. You know, we may not have good understanding of the language of the recitation, or we may not have access to scholars who give us a knowledge of Quran. So we place lots yeah. of barriers, maybe artificial barriers yeah. in the way bet between ourselves and Quran. Yeah. Like, how would you address that real practical problem? Well, we need to change that if that's the belief. Yeah. I don't believe that is the case. I oh. think we've internalized that to some okay. the, the Quran has become a book which is very distant from us. Yes. So, it, I mean, for example, why is it collecting dust on the shelf? Um, it doesn't need to do that. Yeah. Um, look, we're seeing a particular phenomenon on social media at the moment where non Muslims are reading the Quran True. and converting to Islam. Yeah. So, if it if it works for a non-Muslim who's reading the words of Allah Ta'ala and it resonates with their fitrah, yeah. why should it not resonate with the Muslim? The so, book. So are you saying that, sorry to, to cut probably. you, my apologies, are no, you no. saying that in a sense our fitrah has to be conditioned on a continuous basis? Yeah. It's not just about believing yeah. like as an intellectual exercise, but there is a requirement to be associated with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the best way to do that is for Quran. It's continual remembrance of Allah ta'ala. Yeah. The, the interesting thing about human beings and as a historian, one of the things I find fascinating I talk about memory is that we forget. And what, you know, we pray five times a day. Yeah. Sounds surprising. Yes. Because we forget. You know, um, we do, so when we do salah, we pray, we break our worldly routine to pray. Yeah. We then do adqar, 
which is uh, we do tasbih to remember Allah Ta'ala and then we do dua where we ask Allah Ta'ala mm. continuously in our life I say we frame it within the framework of ubudiyah meaning a worldview of submitting to Allah Ta'ala and worshipping Him Yes. and when that's continuously the mantra in your life then your sense of what it means to be human changes you understand that you are a person of submission that as an 18 year old if I had internalized that at that time yeah. some of the Challenges that I was facing may have been um, a lot easier to overcome. Now that requires two things: one, being invested in knowledge, and two, being invested in a community mm -hmm. where you need mentors, as you said, and people within the community who are continuously supporting each other. One, so that being nomadic, and the second thing is being invested in the knowledge. So right. my imam taught me that Yaqub, you can you have only space to love two things. And I said, what's that? He says, love Allah Taala and love people for the sake of Allah Taala. Mm. And you understand how interconnected they are in that sense. Allah Ta'ala is continuously central here yeah. in understanding your being. In that sense, the Qur'an once again becomes so central to this in, un, in order to understand not only the one that created you, but mm. yourself. Nobody can tell you how to be human better than Allah. Mm. And nobody understands the disposition of human beings better than the one who created them. Mm. And... Allah Ta'ala has given you the Qur'an as a way of communicating with you. So my imam used to teach me, in order to talk to Allah Ta'ala, pray salah, namaz. Yeah. And in order for Allah Ta'ala to talk to you, read the Qur'an. Yeah. And I have to instill that, that I want people to make the Qur'an their companion, make time for it, read it before you go to bed. Even if it's a couple of ayats, make it a mainstay in your life because nobody can help you more than Allah Ta'ala in this sense. And this is why... Um, as a young person, I became accustomed to reading books and playing PlayStation and football and being entertained. It seems to be the order of the day. And didn't realize that there was somebody who was, speak, who was speaking to me all the time and I refused to listen, which was for Allah. So this podcast format, what makes it interesting and why I'm willing to come on here, is we are talking about ideas and, and speaking about ideas and making them visible yes. in the consciousness of people is important. Allah Ta'ala does that with the Qur'an. And we need to be able to communicate with him. Okay. And this is why I see, I'm fascinated by non-Muslims reading the Qur'an at the moment and then going, you know, the light bulb moment for them. Oh, wow, Allah Ta'ala is saying this. We have, we have known this. Allah Ta'ala is speaking to humanity. Yes. So this is why I want the Qur'an. It sounds a cliche and, and a given, but in our daily lives, is Allah Ta'ala the companion? Yes. And I believe, so Imam Josie said that when your heart is full of something, Allah, that your, it comes out on your tongues. <laughs> So when I'm listening to people, I want to hear the Allah Ta'ala says in the Qur'an, the Qur'an says recitation yes. and so forth. That's when you know that it's a companion. Yes. And this is why we say it should be a companion, not just a book we read. That Allah is your companion in that sense. That yes. Allah is the one that's, yeah. that you're remembering of all time. Because that's the only thing that gives us true emancipation. Maraklafi, I think that's a really good place to start. So maybe the second point you've raised on your list is... Um, is not surprising because you're an Ottoman historian. You've talked about the importance of history. Mm. Expand on that. Well, um, there was two points I wanted to make to you, which we can add here. Mm. The first thing is I feel that there is a sense of dislocation, right? right? What I mean by that, as a Muslim growing up in the West, I was dislocated from my Islamic historical past mm. and I was dislocated from the historical past of the nation that I was born in. So people would subscribe to queen and country, well, she's dead now, so the king and country, let's just say. But this idea of queen and country when we were growing up, mm. the two great wars, the Tudors, the Victorians, the Romans. Yeah. And none of this history resonated with me as a Muslim. I understood it as a being born in Britain. But it, I didn't internalize it in the way that, let's just say, English folk would internalize it. So there was a distance regarding that history. But even when it came to my own Islamic history, there was a distance. Yeah. I didn't have any knowledge of the motherland, whatever that may be. And I had none, very little knowledge of Islamic past, what it meant to be a Muslim, and so forth. And so there is a dislocation in terms of how do you, how do you belong to something which is omatic when you have no memory of it. Mm. Even if you're a new Muslim who becomes Muslim, right? You have no attachment to the Islamic historical past. You have to acquire that. Mm. So the, the feeling of dislocation is still there. So what I learned when I spoke to English people in particular, they didn't have that dislocation. They understood, they had a sense of being, they had a sense of belonging. They could. They had a repository that they could continuously pull from, mm. whether it was popular culture. Like, let's talk about Brexit. Yeah. They had these posters up, we're saying the Turks are coming. Mm. That That is 
a historical past of Suleiman the, the Magnificent or Al Qanuni. Yes. The Muslims didn't understand what was going on here in England. That that's the repository that's being used. Right. Um, and so that sense of dislocation is problematic because it leaves you quite disjointed as a person. And all human beings need a sense of belonging. Yes. So as a historian, what became important to me is, okay, what did we do? Yeah. What have we done? What do I belong to? What is the civilization that I belong to? Even now, when you listen to Netanyahu and he talks about civilization, that we belong to this civilization and they belong to that. And you start to understand that this notion of civilizational theory is an idea of belonging. Yeah. When the Qatar World Cup happened, one of the problems the Qataris had was while they were able to deal with issues in the now, the politics, what they were unable to deal with was the historical past of the Orientalism, the, 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 the backward Arab, the backward Muslim, and so forth. That they couldn't counter mm -hmm. because you require a historical counter to that, that has a historical past. And we don't do that enough. Yes. So that was one of the problems. So for us as Muslims, when we belong to the Ummah, it's not just the Ummah of today, it's the Ummah of yesteryear and the Ummah of the future. We belong to a corpus. And in order to understand what it means to be Ummatic, you need to understand what you belong to. What civilization did you come from? Yeah. How the Quran was centered to these people? How the way that today can resonate with the past. I'll give you an example. My students were reading something and saying, did the Muslims really um, say these things about Rasulullah Like, you know, they'll, they'll have the veneration of Rasulullah Do they really have that level of taqwa? Did they really have that level of iman? And then when you look at Gaza, and you see in people going, Hasbunallah wa na'mal wakil, inna lillahi wa inna lillahi, Allahu Akbar. And you look at that, and you say, of course they did. Because they have it now. Mm. It's still there. Mm. So why did we become so disjointed in assuming that is the past just some sort of type of fantasy, when in reality it's there. And so what you see is, this is what then I call, in the region at least, there's a collective memory. Yeah. There's a collective memory of Islam that's embedded in those people, yeah. that is passed down from generation to generation, oral tradition, in the buildings, in the food, in the, in the culture, everything is there. They understand the suffering, they understand the collective hardship, but they also understand the collective feeling of belonging to an Islamic civilization. So, so why have we got this, what you call collective amnesia? Yeah, yeah. Or like what's brought this about? I think that colonialism worked very hard in terms of deconstructing sort of like the Muslim collective memory. Yeah. One of the things in the 19th century that we had is we had Muslim networks, which were deliberately deconstructed and disbanded so that Muslims couldn't resonate with one another. Mm. The nation state borders then differentiated one from another. Yeah. And then Muslims who came to the West, like I said, were dislocated from their sure. historical past. Yeah. So there are many layers to this about why people have become distant yeah. from this, this, this memory. And so what, we ha what happens is we become very now, it's a form of presentism. Yeah. Uh, and we see the past as just something that, that we learn so forth. What we don't realize is that your soul itself requires a sense of attachment to those that came before it. Yes. Um, in that sense, I always say the Quran, going back to it, is not a book, of, it's not a historical book, but it's full of history. Why is Allah Ta'ala reminding us about his moments in history? Um, why he's reminding us about Yusuf alayhi mm. salam and Ibrahim alayhi salam and Rasul salam and so forth. Yeah. In fact, I even say when talking about history that the Quran is the first seerah of Rasul salam, right? Because mm. Allah Ta'ala's relationship with the, the Prophet cannot be disconnected because he's the one who gave the Qur'an or revealed the Qur'an via Rasul to people. Yes. In that sense, what you learn is that you can see that Allah Ta'ala is telling us uh, himself that in order to understand what it means to be human, you need to understand what the other people like you went, went through and so forth. And this is what Ibn Khaldun says, that history is not a, a study of just events, it's the study of the human nature. Right. This is why some modern thinkers call him the first sociologist. Mm. The idea of what it means to be human. And we resonate with people that went through particular experiences. And this is why Allah Ta'ala said, you think you struggled? Well, Yusuf alayhi salam went through this. You think people were not listening to your da'wah? Well, Yunus alayhi salam went through this. You think it took you this long to do this? Well, Nuh alayhi salam went through this. And mm. those, those uh, historical moments are important for us because it's coming from the maker. Yeah. And then it gives us a sense of belief. Okay. Mm. Now, some people will say, all right, what about post Rasul But we see consistently how Muslims have used the Quran in Islam as a yardstick to continuously 
help them navigate through their challenges and troubles. Yes. And so when we continuously see that, for example, the Mongol invasion, the Crusades and so forth, we start to understand that Muslims went through these challenges continuously, but they overcame them. They found a way of finding solutions for them. I believe, and this is going to sound harsh, but the, um, the creation of the state of Israel, the activities of the Israelis and the American invasion of the region was far more destructive than the Mongol invasion. Really? Far more destructive than the Mongol invasion. But we have a particular memory of the Mongol invasion, but we forget of the memory of what's happened to us now. I mean, one million people were killed in Iraq. Yeah. Think about it. So in that sense, um, it's far more devastating. But you can see how these wars and destructions, they, they, they disconnect us from the past. Yeah. But if we go back to the past, they should be able to help us navigate these spaces. And I say to people, like, look, the Crusades had a cross on Aqsa for a very long time, longer than the Israeli states. Mm. We overcame that. We're going to overcome this, inshallah. Inshallah, inshallah. Your third point that you've raised in your yeah. list, these yeah. are messages you're giving to your 18-year-old self yeah. that need to be political. Explain that, please. Yeah, I mean, you know, growing up, there was huge debates about whether the youth should be politicized or not, that there's a problem with politics and so forth. You know, interestingly enough, before... I was reading a work by an alim in 19th, 20th century. His name's Mehmet Fethin Efendi. Turkish. Well, Turkish from the Ottoman Empire. Yeah. And in the newspaper Bayan al-Haq, he says the objective of the ulama. Now he speaks about the ulama, but it, I think it can be now used as a general rule. He said there were three things. Il, uh, ilmiye, which is ilm. Diniye, which was din. And siyaset, which was siyaset. That these three things um, ought to be uh, internalized in the ulama. That they should have a grasp of these three things. Right. Because these are the main things in regards to the regulation of the, the state of our community and society. Mm. So when I looked into that, it was a given that we need knowledge, ilmi. And, and, and knowledge is, you know, if knowledge is not for the sake of Allah Ta'ala, then what's the point of the knowledge? So all forms of knowledge have to be learned for the sake of pleasing your Lord. And all forms of knowledge will help you in this dunya. Of course they would. Mm. Dini, now this is interesting, the distinction between ilm and din. Well, we say ilm and amal. So you have ilm, but it has to be practice. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, what's the point of it? Mm -hmm. And deen is the manifestation and the implementation of the ilm that you've learned. There has to be a responsibility of the practicing of the faith. But mm -hmm. then he said siyaset, the idea that if Muslims are not politically inclined, if they don't have any political agency, if they're unaware of their political responsibilities, then this is where we end up in the situation we're in now, a sense of hopelessness. Yeah. It's a given. I mean... I don't want to use a Zionist as an example, but I will here. They understood they needed political authority. Yeah. We've also understood that we require political authority to safeguard our own interests. The West have also understood that. This is why they try to marginalize the attempts that Muslims are making to get some sort of agency. Mm. The question I always say to young people, and I can see in them, they're very driven towards being politically inclined. That's the disposition of human beings. Mm. But what is the correct form of politics? That's the discussion we need to have. Yeah. And I'm open to say, I'm happy, and some people might critique me on this, but say, maybe we don't know. If that's the starting point that we don't know, some people will say they do know, and that's fine. Mm -hmm. But if we are at a stage where young people say we don't know regarding our politics, then we should know. And let's have the discussions and debates to understand our politics. And I will say this, if our moral and ethical values that come from Islam tell us how to be a good human being, Tell us how to be a good father and mother. Tell us how to be a good brother and sister. Tell us how to be a good neighbor. Tell us how to be a good human being. Are you telling me that they don't tell us how to, and they don't inform our politics? Because at the moment, there mm. seems to be a detachment yeah. between those young Muslims who go yeah. into politics yeah. and those young Muslims who go into ilmiya, into mm. ilm activities. Mm -hmm. And so the ones who develop in the Islamic sciences yeah. tend to be very apolitical. Yeah. And the ones who develop in, in politics tend to not have uh, Islam as a backdrop. Um, yeah. I think that's very problematic. Yeah. But you're calling for somewhat a synergy between, totally. between the two. Look, yeah. I mean, there was an assumption um, that it has to be embodied in one person. And yeah. maybe in the past that might have been the case. If that's not the case right now, yeah. then this synergy is the first step forward. Ah. Um, if you don't have the skills, um, then work with people who do have the skills. The point I kept making... And I keep making is when this deconstruction of the 19th century networks happened, yeah. we became very specialized in particular areas and we didn't collaborate. And yes. I think this collaboration is necessary. Yeah. So if you are not politically inclined, turn to somebody who is. And in that sense, 
um, the ilm, the deen, and the siyasa has to work together in yeah. that sense. So, yeah. our, my appeal to anyone who's in the field of ulum al in particular would be that we require from you a particular positionality in regards to our politics. We require from you to be involved in this. We require from you to, to, to give us the frameworks, if that is not the case, of our ethics, morals, and Absolutely. agency regarding our politics. And the activists, yeah. we say to them that if they are disconnected from the Ilmi people, to have a particular decorum in the way that they interact with them. Yeah. But at the same time, to appeal to them that this is what you require. Because secular politics at the moment, and you're an expert on this far more than I am, has taken us down a rabbit hole. And it's taken us to the point that we're at at the moment. Yes. And maybe it is time to start thinking about a change. Um, and that change can come from our tradition. And we do not need to be embarrassed of the tradition. Yeah. The tradition is very powerful in many ways. And what does our tradition say? You know, yeah. um, And when we're looking at some of the destruction in Gaza, for example, we are seeing a distinction between, you know, it is true, this distinction between civilizational theory. Yeah. A group of people who are, re are upholding our tradition in an exemplary way that is not only changing the hearts and minds of Muslims, but it's changing the hearts and minds of people around the world. Yes. Um, and that is a tradition I'm proud of. And if our tradition is creating a group of people who are suffering but are standing upright and are sturdy and are safeguarding the interests of not just themselves, but the rest of the Muslim Ummah, yeah. then we have a responsibility to try to find um, a space in our politics of the tradition they belong to, mm. that they are calling for. So. You know, the tradition of the people in Palestine, what are they saying? The, all the symbols, the slogans, the emotions, the rhetoric is all Islamic. Yes. It's Islam. It's Allah they're turning to. Sure. They recognize that. So we have to have a sense of politics that resonates with them. On Turkish TV, there was a, a, a Palestinian who had sent a, a text message that hit me hard. He said that I was sent a message that we are doing dua for you to make Allah Ta'ala protect you. And he responded and said that we are doing dua for you they might, may Allah Ta'ala give you hidayah. So the responsibility is collective in this sense. And the sense yeah. of helplessness that we feel collectively is also the fact that we have an absence of agency. That agency is political agency in yes. some ways. Yeah. And Islam has a large corpus of um, telling us how we do our politics. And those discussions, I think now more than ever, are necessary. I think so. Yeah. I think so. I mean, I, I met with a group of ulama recently and uh, my point to them and i think they, they took it very well and in fact they were thinking about this my point to them was if you are going to talk about politics just to say it's halal or yeah. voting is permissible or, or something like that and then walking away yeah. you know that's not enough because then you end up getting these very dubious muslim politicians like shabana mahmoud yeah. or even sadiq khan who end up doing all sorts of wrong yeah. uh, because they may have premised their actions on your on your initial statement, you have to be more actively, not even necessarily involved, as you said, but more actively engaging with the, the moral and ethical frameworks of those politicians. Well, I'll give an example. I'm not going to mention names, but currently particular activists are upset with the positions that certain ulama have held yeah. by the statements they made or the non-statements they've made. The reason why that's the case, now people might say that they, the activist behavior is unacceptable, but I understand it. I understand it because they have an expectation from us, people who are of a particular authority, who represent them, who represent a particular form of knowledge and authority to speak on their behalf. And it's not being done in a way that is working with them. Mm. In that sense, and this was my point about criticism, is that I'm happy to take the criticism if there is a disconnect between me and the community. Mm. So if the community is unhappy with my politics, the first thing I do is rather than critiquing the community, go into the community and say, okay, what is it about my politics that you have a problem with? Let's discuss this and let's hash this out to see how can we streamline this so that we can actually have a politics that works for you and me and comes from our traditional framework. Mm -hmm. um, so those conversations need to be had. Mm -hmm. I, I feel that way now more than ever. Yes. Um, I don't think we have a position. We have we can be apolitical anymore. That's a yeah. political position, by the way. Yes. To be apolitical. Of course it is. I think yeah. human beings by their nature, Al-Ghazali said this, it, the human being is a political agent. So in some ways, the community and us, and those of us, look, we're all deficient in something. I accept that myself. I'm a historian. Yes. Alhamdulillah, one of the things I found is that people from the field of Ulum al -Din have in invited me into this space because we're on the same side. I'm a Muslim. I pray five times a day. You know, I, I, I want the betterment of Islam and let's work together to bridge this gap. And when they say to me, 
And they do. Uh, Brother Yaqub, this doesn't work with us. I said, okay, that's interesting. Let me think about that. Yeah. Because I'm a Muslim and I understand that. And I would say to them, you know, politically this is happening. Historically that happened. And we need to bridge that gap. So we're not enemies here. We're on the same yeah. side. Yeah. So moving on then to your fourth yeah. point. Yeah. Being able to take criticism. Yeah. Yeah. Explain that. You know, as an academic, it's really interesting. One of the things I've learned about academia, it's a very toxic place. Yeah. If I went into a, a regular space like and, and, and I went out there to speak to people, people are very welcoming. They, they want to hear what you have to say. The minute I go to an Af academic conference, it's antagonistic. Yeah. From the offset, because they're trained to to find holes in what you're saying. So they're trained to look for the flow. And what I learned from that is that ex the extension of that type of criticism culture I see on social media. And I wasn't on social media for a very long time. I came into social media because of the issue of Gaza. Uh, I felt the need to so sort of say something. But what I learned was that taking criticism for a human being is hard. And I learned after a while that I need to learn how to take criticism. Um, especially for my community, which sounds very strange. Yeah. Um, when my community now critique me, rather than firing back, which is the instinctive way to do it, yeah. I say, okay, wait, why is the perception like that? What if I, first, let me look inwardly and say, okay, what's going on here? Because those are my people. And if they feel this way about me, we need to find a relationship as a way of changing that. And maybe, maybe they're right. Maybe I'm holding a particular position which is unacceptable in accordance yeah. to Islam or their feelings and sentiments. So when you're in a position of power or authority, it's very easy to critique the mass, but it takes a particular level of introspection to say, hang on a minute, I'm the one who has authority. I need to come down to the ground here a second and engage with the community. And rather than judge them, I am, it's my responsibility to try to help them. Mm. And so how can we create a reciprocal relationship rather than being hurt by their criticism? Say, okay, look, um, maybe maybe we can do this differently. And for a very long time, when you're a person of knowledge, you can be quite, you know, I learned this from a friend of mine. She said um, that academics have a sense of hubris and insecurity built in together. Yeah. And you don't want to come across as a Muslim, as a person of hubris, of arrogance, because you have knowledge that other people don't have. What you want to do is bridge the gap. Yeah. Um, and so I, I'm working harder now, and I can only talk for myself, and I wish I had said this to my younger self, that you need to learn to take criticism better. Because in the past, when I was younger, it was harder for me to take that criticism. Yeah. Um, and that's just the way human beings are designed. So what do you require? One, the Qur'an, again. Uh, Allah Ta'ala critiques us more than anyone else. Mm. And there is a sense of humility in being critiqued by your Lord. Yes. Um, so you take that on the chin in terms of what Allah Ta'ala says. And then what you do is you turn to people of trust. You, you say, listen, uh, you know, help me out here. So you need people around you who can help you along. And then you turn to your community and you be available to them and say, okay, listen, it's very possible that the community could be wrong. That's okay. But if the relationship is there, then you can find a way of navigating that mm. space. And often the reason why the criticism can't be taken is because there's a distance. And so for me, I, I believe in closing that distance now. Mm. You know, um, Rasul Sallam, when you see, he talked to Osama and Imam Ali radiallahu anhu continuously, they were very young. Hmm. He, so he didn't only seek advice from people who were older than him and of his age group. He sought advice from people who were younger than him because yes. he understood that was the next generation. They had particular thoughts and ideas. Yeah. So for me, I believe this now more than, than ever that while there is a particular decorum of criticism, and I accept that, but I still believe that maybe now um, if we can all as Muslims learn, one, in the way that we critique each other, and two, um, to be able to handle that criticism. Because sometimes, I'm new to social media, some of the activities I see on Muslim Twitter scare me a little bit. Yes. It's not the way that we did things. I always say to my students, rather than sending a WhatsApp message to each other, just call up the person or go see them. Yeah. Sit down with them straight away. Bypass that because, you know, shaitan has a way of Absolutely. occupying the mind. Absolutely. So. So yeah, this is why I felt that way. And your fifth um, advice to yourself is being ummatic. This is a new idea, a new term, mm. at least a new label that's mm. been developed. I think Away Miranjam has popularized it, yeah. Professor Away Miranjam. Um, what does it really mean to be ummatic? I think what's interesting is that by using the term ummatic, we have a particular expect or an understanding at least that the ummah that, that we belong to has have a particular set of... Um, practices, behaviors, 
traditions that we belong to, right? Mm. And in order to move away from the very, uh, how can I say, individual-centered world that we live in, yeah, um, we need to turn to a more communal-based uh, um, sort of way, way of thinking. That's not to say the individual is not important. We are accountable for ourselves, and Allah Ta'ala will hold us accountable for what we do. Mm. But one of the interesting things I say, for example, the Quran again, is often people in the modern world, they'll read the Quran in terms of how does it resonate with me as an individual. I'm suffering, let me read the book, and how do I take it? And the kitab in that sense. But what I say is the Quran also talks to us as a collective. Mm. Anyone who's gone to the Jumma Khutbah, the Khatib is talking to everybody at the same time. Mm. The Quran is talking to us as a community right. in many ways. And in that sense, you start to see very quickly of what it means to be community-based, where the individual will put aside sometimes their own self-interest for the interest of the greater good. Mm. So here, for example, now when we're looking at Gaza, one of the things I noticed very quickly is that we need to put aside any self-interest we have in various parts of the world for the greater good of the community. So any in terms of the activities you're doing here and so forth, and me yeah. in Turkey and whatnot, yeah. that, that selflessness um, in regards to the betterment of the community is important, and it's it. The family is an extension of that. You would put your li- body in the way to protect your family. The community is an extension. This is why Rasulullah Sallam he calls he used the word ikhwan. Mm. They are my brothers. There's a reason for that. Yeah. We think that way that we are a, a a connected community. So now to be omatic then, and one of the things that social media, new technology, newspapers, and television has done. It has amplified what it means to belong to a mass of a billion people. Yes. It's amplified our suffering. It's amplified uh, a sort of like um, a lack of agency and, and what it means to be Muslim, right? But what is also done is it created a sense of consistency. Right. A, a sense of collective um, appreciation towards things. And what you realize very quickly that it doesn't matter where you are around the world, the Muslim is very consistent in in the Aqid in terms of the way they practice certain things. So in that sense, to be ummatic now, and I, I want to make this clear, you can't have an ummatic experience if Allah Ta'ala is not centered to it and is not driven by the cause of his message of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Otherwise, it just becomes another secular endeavor. Right. So the, the centrality of the ummatic paradigm for me is the centrality of Allah Ta'ala in it, which then makes us different mm-hmm. than everyone else in that sense, right? Yes. And let's look at the Palestinian issue then. Yeah. If you make the Palestinian issue simply a human issue, what it does is it sort of like removes the Ummah from this narrative. The Ummah just disappears because it becomes a lot more meta. Mm -hmm. Now, I've just said to you that in order to understand what it means to be human, okay, we have a different understanding of what it means to be human in that sense. And if we're looking at it from the human rights perspective, well, one of the things we see is that, yes, it is a human issue. We're not denying that. Mm -hmm. But... The perspective of it just simply being a human issue, it relegates the Ummah with any agency. Mm. Okay, let's reduce it to it being a Palestinian issue. Mm. By reducing it simply to being a Palestinian issue and not a, a, a Ummatic issue, once again, the Ummah have nothing to, to add to this. Mm. They have nothing to say. So on both occasions, whether it's on a human issue, which is wide, or a narrow issue of being Palestinian, the Ummah don't exist here. And we mm. have... A belonging to the issue of Palestine because mm. the idea is it's a place of Tawhid. Yes. It's a place we call it Islamic Jerusalem. There's a the Israelis are not just simply killing people, they're removing any remnant of Islam's presence in the region. They're trying to remove the memories of people there. And the memories of the people there were that they lived under Islam for centuries and it contributed towards a particular discourse. Mm. That in is embodied in people. Yes. In us, and that I think is important. And in that sense, to revive that spirit of belonging, we may not be able to physically help one another in the way that uh, we see fit sometimes, but still to be connected, to have resources we can pass over, to have ideas we can pass over. We have to be spiritually, intellectually, financially, and physically interconnected once again. This distance can no longer exist, mm. and this does not require. Leadership. This is done from the perspective of our agency as yeah. as Muslims, you know. And point number six, mm. um, showing rahma to one another. I think compassion is necessary, yeah. right? And going back to the point of Allah Taala, um, Allah Taala is Ar Rahman Ar Rahim. It's, it's beautiful in that sense. Mm. That five times a day when we're praying, 
we first do the Bismillah. Yes. Bismillah, Ar Rahman, Ar Rahim, and then we recite the Fatiha. Mm. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alamin, Ar Rahman, Ar Rahim. And that, what you see is that there is no better form of compassion than the compassion of the one that created you. Right? And to be Rahim is a quality that's expected from the Muslim to show this level of compassion. And what I've noticed more and more with secularism is it's become so disruptive that the notion of having compassion towards your fellow yeah. is absent. The having a sense of compassion towards those who are not your fellows is missing. Do we see that in, I don't know, there are say 18 year olds today in the teenage population, the lack of compassion? I'm not sure, I, uh, to be honest with you. Um, yeah. I find the 18 year olds very interesting actually. You know, they were perceived, and wrongly so, hmm. that they were the Netflix generation, generation, whatever, you know, TikTok, and, you know, they didn't have this sense of compassion. And yet when Gaza happened, they moved in a way which was phenomenal. Right. They actually moved in a way. I am no longer concerned about them. You know, I used to say that we are looking for the trees, not realizing the seeds have already been planted. Hmm. They were amazing. And it was that compassion, instinctive compassion in them that's driven them towards their activism. Right. And their activism is an activism of compassion. I can see it. What I'm saying is when I was that age, I lacked it. Right. right? And I want them to maintain that compassion. It's that compassion that we have that we're looking towards the Palestinians saying, what's going on? It's the absence of compassion on the other side, actually, mm -hmm. that is permitting the indiscriminate killing of innocent people. In, and our tradition, and this is why I wanted to center on Allah Ta'ala, that he's Rahman and Rahim. He is the most compassionate. It is an expectation from our tradition to show compassion towards people. Mm -hmm. It is in our tradition that someone, even if they're guilty, if we don't prove it, then it's better to free a person who's guilty than to incriminate someone who's innocent. Mm -hmm. That is from a space of compassion, irrespective of how they put the, the question across. Yes. And in that sense, you know, um, when we talk about Allah Ta'ala being Rahman, is Imam Ghazali said that that was a proper name of Allah Ta'ala. Him being, and this is why there's a surah in the Quran, being mm -hmm. Ar-Rahman. The idea that Rahim is the compassion of any, everything dunya related. And we, he's Ar-Rahim. So we can show Rahmat to people in a dunya sense. And then he's Ar-Rahman. He created heaven. He created your soul. He, he created everything in Jannah. He created the cosmos. That we can't replicate. That's mm -hmm. the ultimate compassion. And we turn to our maker to show us that ultimate compassion so that we don't feel suicidal, so that we don't feel depressed, that because uh, human beings can be very mean to each other. Mm. And the maker is the one that we turn to to help us through it. And then what's expected from us is to be a people of compassion. Mm. And I have to stress that because I, it's not that the young people don't have it. I want them to keep it. I want them to maintain it. In this struggle right now, in this struggle of showing the world what's going on, and I believe this, now's the time to be Muslim. Mm. Now's the time to show people what it means to be Muslim. Now's the time to show people what Islam is. And that compassion that they have that comes from their culture, which is Islam, mm. to not abandon that, to not forsake that, irrespective of the way people treat us. And it is that compassion that's going to drive us forward to bring about change, because change is necessary and it's coming. And number seven, mm. which is uh, which caught me by surprise, the need for STEM. Yeah, so I'm a historian, right? Yeah. And... Um, you know, more and more people speak to me and they always ask me about the intellectual space and so forth. But what I notice is that we need skills in the STEM spaces, which we go into traditionally. But it's how can we use our STEM skills for the benefit of the Ummah? So this is science and math. Science, and technology, maths and so right. forth, right? So when you look, like I was looking at the issue of Gaza and I was looking at some of the companies where Muslims were working for some of these companies and it freaked me out that they were driven towards assuming that they could get up the career ladder or get some experience or so forth in these areas. And what I noticed is that Muslims are in every field of science and technology. So this, you know, bogus claim about Nobel Peace Prize, about, you know, hmm. the West patting itself on the back of choosing its own. What you notice is that if you go into the, in Britain, for example, if the Muslims left the NHS, it would collapse overnight. Yes. So Muslims are in many of these fields. When I looked at Gaza, for example, Gaza taught me something really interesting. The majority of the doctors in Gaza were trained in Gaza. Yes. Oh, well, the majority. The majority of the journalists in Gaza were trained in Gaza. The majority of the weapons of resistance that were created were made in Gaza. They were local. In that sense, what the Ummah needs is its technicians, its scientists, its businessmen, and so forth. 
being driven by the ethical and moral, moral standards of Islam for the community, right. not just for oneself in terms of the career and so forth. But now, how can we be selfless to put it back in the community? Because we have it. So you're not saying that, um, because when I initially read it, mm. I thought, well, wait a minute. Most of us, most of the Muslim mm. community do not go into humanities. Mm -hmm. They go into science and engineering yeah. and maths. Um, so your argument isn't that that should change. Your argument is we should be utilizing that yeah. uh, for the ummah. Yeah, I think so. I'm not saying they're not. Yeah. But I'm saying we need to have a different approach of integrating this into a space which is alternative yeah. to the current capitalist model, to the current neoliberal model. I mean, yeah. when I'm looking at some of the weapons that are being used, I'm saying, wait, hang on a minute. This is unacceptable. Yes. And can we as Muslims create an alternative space that can be of benefit to the ummah in these spaces? And I'll give you an example. Yeah. When I had hijama done, hijama is cupping yes. for your audience. Um, the person who did my hijama was Syrian. And um, he was a very wonderful man. He took out time out of his day. He did the hijama. And he said to me, before I do the insertions, can you recite Fatah and Ayat al -Qurs? I found it interesting and I asked him, um, I said, oh, um, Alhamdulillah, Ya is that, uh, why did you, um, uh, you know, um, ask me to recite? And he said, we need to take permission from Allah Ta'ala before we do this. Hmm. Okay. Then I found up a friend of mine who's a surgeon, also Syrian. I said, I'll ask you a question, sure. When you're operating on someone, do you read Fatiha and Aydul? He goes, no, man, we just chop it out. Hmm. What I realized is that in the STEM spaces, it's not just in a humanity where there's an absence of Allah Ta'ala's presence in the yes. knowledge space. Yeah. There's an absence in all forms of knowledge in regards to the centrality of Allah Ta'ala in the way we do things. In that sense, if our STEM um, experts were not just simply Muslims who prayed, but were Allah-centered, then the way that they did STEM would be very, not very, it would be different. But you're saying it should be Ummah-centered as well. I think so. Yeah. I think so. And so they should move back to the Muslim world to give their um, knowledge look, and expertise? So my position initially used to be that um, that we should be moving back to the Muslim world. I think that might be difficult for everybody. And I understand that. Yeah. But I do believe that the knowledge should, should be integrated between the Muslim world and non-Muslim world. And that's Muslims do not simply need to struggle in the West and feel isolated. They are part of the Ummah. And this omatic approach means that they are integrated with us and we are integrated with them. And we yeah. should be supporting one another right. with the various different agencies we have to try to, to give the Ummah a head start. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, um, you know, the knowledge and the technology and so forth is necessary. We as Muslims now in the Muslim world don't need to go to Harvard, Princeton and Yale. Yeah. The internet, to some degree, in this podcast is an example of that. It sort of created a democratization of information, right? We can attain the knowledge and information. What we need is those human connectivities again. We need to feel connected with one another. Yes. Um, and that's where I want to see there is a development of STEM subjects taking place in the Muslim world. But it can be sped up if the networks and connections were increased. And we put aside our own self-interest. Right. And I mean not just on an individual level, yes. even in terms of like nation-state level. And your eighth point is uh, bridging the generational gap. Yeah, so, you know, um, it's funny because um, I, I watch anime hmm. and people make fun of me all the time about a guy that watches anime. But one of the interesting things, I watch an anime called One Piece. Right. Uh, and one of the interesting things about One Piece, I've been watching it for 20, 25 years, you know. Um, but one of the interesting things about One Piece was they're a group of pirates, these kids, and they're known as the worst generation. Hmm. And the world government, which is trying to control the world, um, calls them the worst generation and the world government now we've discovered is being led by shaitan it's really mm. fascinating yeah. but this worst generation is the best generation the generation that's going to change and what you notice about this best generation is that it's able to achieve the objective of its future because of the support of the generation that came before right. that there is rather than seeing a disconnect between the generational gap to try to create an integrate between the generations in that sense mm. and so I as an educator who teaches young people uh, I always feel like I said integrated with my students where I want to know what is the next fat what is the next cool thing what is it that they're doing because that's the nature of how things work but also because as we spoke about how can I part like part my wisdom on them to help them navigate this space and also say look so in Islam these are the ethics and values we belong to and these things that you're doing right now can you just re-look at them again mm. in that sense? So 
they have a level of accountability where they look up to us and we can hold them accountable. But at the same time, we have a sense of uh, responsibility of helping them through this. And we always talk about this. Every generation talks about this, the generational gap. And we need to find a way of bridging that generational gap. I have found, and I say this again, mm. is that young people um, have been the most interesting in this, for me, this issue to do of Gaza. Right. They really have moved in a way which I found fascinating. And in that sense, um, I am trying to work harder to to support that because they are the future Yes. in the end of the day. And um, that that generational gap that we believe in shouldn't be there. Um, so, so yeah. Okay. And number nine, being process-driven, not progress-driven. So, yeah, so I've spoken to a lot of my friends about this before. Um, so progress is a very Western mo concept of modernity. It's a right. very from the Enlightenment, that you continuously are progressing in society and improving yourself, right? Yes. Now, one of the pro problems that Western society is having is that, you know, we've got to a point of progress and now they can't actually see, like, where are we going with this progress? Yes. So it creates a level of, like, there's a sense of dystopia. And you see it in the movies as well, right? Yes. Now, it's not that we're not interested in progress, but being process-driven, which means that you put in the effort, you do the work, and the um, sort of, like... Um, the result is in the hands of Allah Ta'ala is more important. Because what that does is that you become driven by working hard to please Allah Ta'ala, but recognize that you may not see the results of your actions mm. in that sense. And that's what it means to be omatic in many ways. The, I always use the example of the Isra al-Miraj. When Rasulullah is going to Jannah in the Isra al-Miraj, he sees many prophets on the way. And some prophets have thousands of followers. Some have hundreds, some have tens. Some have very little or any. So what was the point of those? Well, they were put in dents in society so that when the next person came, the next sort of prophet came, people ran with them. You maintain a memory of an idea. If you see the case of Ibrahim alayhi salam, this was the whole idea of Ibrahim alayhi salam, that when he built the Kaaba, for example, and so forth, that he wasn't, he didn't see the millions of people who were coming on the Hajj and Umrah. It's happening now. Yeah. We as Muslims, and as a Muslim historian who writes about Islamic history, I've noticed that Many thinkers and many Muslim leaders and many Muslim communities, when they did something, didn't see the fruits of their labor, but oh, their labor paid off yeah. later on. It, it was amplified by a community that came after. Yes. So in that sense, the reason why I say we should be process different is so that we are not despondent, that when we're putting in the effort, we're putting in the hard work, and we're not seeing the fruits of our actions. Yes. But the process is important because... The um, the victories in the hands of Allah Ta'ala This is why I started with the surah Iza Jaya Nasrullah Go on, sorry bro you want No, 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 no I, I was just going to say that um, That's all well and fine But yeah. of course then you've got the flip side Where you've got someone who Does substandard activities mm -hmm. all the time mm -hmm. And continuously does that activity Thinking that Allah Ta'ala will give us the result And so we don't have to worry too much About perfecting our action It's not about not worrying about perfecting that action. It's about doing the maximum of what we can. Uh -huh. This is why in the Quran, we talk about in, in, in Maryam, what does she do? Allah Ta'ala asks her to stand up yeah. and put her hand on the tree. Now, Allah Ta'ala could have given her the, the dates. I think it's the dates from the tree. And, mm. But he expected an, a, an effort from her. And that effort was, a, what is the effort expected? The maximum effort, by the way. So mm. what we are trying to do is we are not driven by the fact that we're doing an action and who knows what will happen. Yes. We do have milestones that we're working towards. Mm. But what we, I'm saying is, is that if you don't see it in your lifetime, it's okay. Yeah, and in the end of the day, your objective is to do what? To please Allah Ta'ala. Yes. Victory is in the hands of Allah. So in that sense, you know, like today, for example, mm. um, people's, I had a young kid say to me once, I wish I was around in the time of Salah al -Din. Yes. Ayubi. And I said, look, you're, alhamdulillah, you're in the, now you can say to Allah Ta'ala, you put me in this period and this time, and I hold on to Islam like a hot piece of coal, and I struggled for it, and I worked hard for it. Hmm. And you became a person who maintained the memory of Islam, and in the next generations, hmm. they ran with it. Yeah. The reason why we're Muslim today is because people were Muslim before who did all sorts of activities. And on many occasions, like in the case of Badr, there were people who died in Badr who never saw Uhud. Hmm. There were people who died in Uhud who never saw Fatal Makkah. This is why, you know, I always talk about um, uh, uh, Ammar ibn Yasir. And Ammar's story is really fascinating yeah. because when his parents were being tortured and they became shaheed, um, he turns to Rasul Sallam and he mentions this to them. 
And I was thinking in my head, my, my student said to me, you know what's amazing about Ammar radiallahu an is that um, if you had told Ammar at the time that we're going to um, establish a, a center in Medina, that we're going to be victorious at Badr, that we're going to do Fat al Makkah, that we're going to, Ammar, you're going to see like Aqsa. It wouldn't be surprised if Ammar looked at you and, are you serious? Because imagine what he's just gone through. And yet Ammar saw all of those things. Ammar went to Medina. Ammar was aware, you know, in terms of Badr. Ammar saw Fat al Makkah. Ammar, during the time of Omar bin Qattab, um, saw the, the conquest of, wow. uh, of um, um, Aqsa. In yeah. that sense, all the people that came before him, that were including his parents who died in the way for Ammar to see that objective, is important. And that's why it's important to be communal based. That's not to, to, to say that the lives that we are losing is, is, is not important. In fact, Allah Ta'ala takes care of that by saying that they are shaheed. Mm-hmm. That by saying they are shaheed. And what I want to say is this. If our beloveds are being butchered in this way and they're going to Jannah, imagine the effort we need to put in to replicate that same level of, of, of being entered into Jannah. We need to work hard. Yeah. We really need to work hard. Um, so in that sense, to, to stop the um, brutality of what's taking place in Palestine or in China or in India and so forth, you have to wake up every morning and say, I want to liberate my people. Mm. Every single morning you say, right, let's go. This is what we're going to do today. And so... For me, it's not, when I'm saying we're process driven, I'm not saying, you know, like we're just going to sit on our laurels. It's the maximum effort you put in. Right. And then Allah Ta'ala rewards you for that maximum effort. You're not simply being tested because of the hardship you're put through. Mm. You're also being tested on what did you do when others were going through hardship? When others were going through the struggle, what did you do to emancipate them, to free them, to allow them to remove the struggles and obstacles in the way that's what we are being tested on here right now mm. and we need to be st- we need to stand up and be counted for that and that's what i mean by being process driven is the idea that we continuously work for the cause of allah ta'ala and his messenger we yeah. trust allah ta'ala yeah. victory is in the hands of allah ta'ala mm. we don't quit we don't give up but don't be despondent if you can't see the types of fruits you want to see yeah. and this will be my last point which is in islam we believe in this thing allah ta'ala Ali gives you what you want he gives it to you later. I mean, so Allah Ta'ala, yeah, He gives you what you want. He gives it to you later or He gives you something better. Mm-hmm. Now, what people sometimes have misunderstood is He gives you something better. It doesn't have to be dunya. Yeah. It can be akhirah. Yeah. And so in our understanding of the timeline of process, it's akhirah orientated. Mm-hmm. So it's not just dunya orientated. That the akhirah came before us, the akhirah came bef- after us. We're driven towards akhirah in that mm-hmm. sense. Yeah. And so if we don't get what we want as a community in this dunya, no problem, alhamdulillah, we're trying to please Allah Ta'ala. Yeah. We're akhirah driven and so on. So we'll come to your final point, the 10th yeah. um, advice you would give to your 18-year-old self. And th- again, this sounds like a, a bit of a strange bit of advice. So mm. you would tell your 18-year-old self to, to read Fukuyama or at least to learn from Fukuyama's end of history narrative. Explain all about that to me. You know, it's interesting, like this end of history, this idea that history ended. And we've yeah. internalized this as Muslims, that that's it. You know, the Khilafah is gone, the Ottoman Empire collapsed, yeah. and history's ended. It's 100 years coming up in yeah, March, right? That's right. And, yeah. I, and I make the argument, we're still here. Yeah. We still exist. Islam is still here. And as a result, history has not ended. We are part of this process. Um, and the assumption that we've internalized that it, it's done, it's <laughs> finished. And that we as Muslims have nothing to say in this matter. No, we have everything to say in this matter. Yeah. You know, I, I joke all the time um, in Turkey. I say, you know, the interesting thing about Liverpool is that when they go in the Champions League, they go in it to win it. Hmm. But when a Turkish team goes into the Champions League, they're just happy to be there. <laughs> we as Muslims are not just happy to be here. We have something to offer in regards to our civilization. We have, you know, this struggle when they said to us, uh, for example, the clash of civilizations. But there is a particular struggle of Iman and Kufr in that sense, that we believe in a particular notion of Iman in that sense. And what does it mean to believe? And what does it mean to be different? Mm. We have everything to offer humanity in that context. We have an idea of what it means to belong to the cosmos. We have an idea of what it means in terms of nature. We have an, we, when we say you're Khalifa in this dunya, it means that you are responsible for everything in it. Modern day capitalism doesn't allow that. So when I live in Istanbul and I see the cats and dogs walking down the street, yeah. we are responsible for those animals as well. Because those animals will tell us to the Allah on the day of judgment, they abused us. So what you realize is from our culture, we have something to offer. 
we are not, we do not need to to continuously be in. Res- we don't need to respond or react all the time. And in that sense, history hasn't ended. History is here; it's continuing, and we are part of that history. And in that sense, once you start to understand that you are part of the history, and that when people talk about the destruction of something, and I say, okay, but the construction of it can happen again, just like it happened before. That when they talk about the Crusaders, and then they make you believe, and modernity made us believe this, that the modern nation states are going to be here forever, that the Israeli state is going to be here forever, that this is not going to change, this is the status quo, that is the fallacy of the modern mind. Pandemic taught us that. Pandemic taught us that human beings are, are far from being infallible. In fact, modernity couldn't save us from the sickness and so forth. That all the modern tech, it really showed the fragility of human beings, um, irrespective of what you believe on that. And so here, even what we're seeing, even the issue of Gaza and so forth, is a fragility of modernity. It's a fragility of the West. And because of that fragility, we're seeing an amplification of violence as a way of closing the lid. It's too late. It's done. Pandora's box is opened. And so in that sense, for us as Muslims, I want to really say this. I do not want to be known in the history of Islam as the Muslims who did nothing. (laughs) When I look at our rich history, we've made many mistakes and we've gone through many issues and we critique people of the past by saying this person should have done this such and such. And we venerate people who've done wonderful things in the past and let's stand up and be counted. Let's not go down in history as the people that will be known as the ones who did nothing or very little. And I say this about our leadership, I will not hold back on that. But our leadership has really failed us on this occasion and shame on them because they're going to go down in history as the leadership that did nothing Mm. He, during the Mongol invasion, during the the Crusades, during the destruction of Andalusia, or whatever you name it, even the transatlantic slave trade, our leadership resisted. It showed a level of resistance. Now we can critique whether it was good or bad, but they did it at least. Where on this occasion, whether it's local or global, the resistance has been very weak. And that hurts. That hurts a lot. And I think this is why I'm trying to make the case that history hasn't ended. We are here. We're going to be counted for, and people are going to write about us. Yeah, they're going to write about us, and they better make sure that they write something that we can show that we're proud about. Yakub, you are a eminent historian, I suppose, of of Ottoman history. Yeah, um, can you envisage a time where we can see a super state like the Ottoman state governing the affairs of the Muslim world? The honest answer to that question is I don't know, but what mm. I'd like us to imagine is anything's possible. Right. Anything's possible. Why Why not? If you'd have spoken to somebody in the time of the Umayyads and said, could you imagine the conquest of Istanbul and the Ottoman Empire? They would have said, no, no way, no yeah. chance. Yeah. Um, for me, it's the issue of imagination. That what the, his, the past tells us, it's a Quranic injunction and it's a rational in, um, um, idea that nothing lasts forever. In this sense, you know... Um, we should have the imagination of the possibility of what comes next. Hmm. As Muslims, when I said we're process-driven, the idea of process-driven is not that different from progress. But the point I was making is that we should be always working for the betterment. And so when we look at our nation states, when we look at our communities, Hmm. when we look at our society, when we look at our politics, can it be better? Of course it can. And what we do as Muslims is we do not, this is the difference between process and progress. Progress disregards the past. We don't. We use our tradition as a repository. We go back into the past and say, how does it give us meaning? We go back into the Quran and Sunnah and say, how does it give us meaning? We go back into the Sira, back into history and say, how does it give us meaning? And what history tells us is that this Ummah is very resilient and has achieved many wonderful things. I love this Ummah. This Ummah is amazing because this is the Ummah of Rasulullah Sallam. And, you know, what Gaza has taught me and what the earthquake in Turkey has taught me when I saw that, is our people are so resilient. They're so resilient. So why isn't the leadership showing the same level of gumption? Yeah. And so in that sense, what I'm telling you to tell some of your younger generation and so forth, is imagine everything. Mm. Imagine it. Once you can imagine the possibility of the future, only then can you drive towards working towards it. If you want to imagine a super state, then imagine a super state. If you want to imagine a state that's like, you know, I don't know, today's Russia where... You know, you've got states around you that you have spheres of influence. Imagine it. If you want to imagine decentralized, whatever. I, I'm not interested in that. What I'm interested in, have the imagination. It's weird. We can imagine the deconstruction of nations. Mm. We can't imagine the coming together of nations. Mm. We can imagine the deconstruction of peoples. 
We can't imagine the coming together of peoples. And I say, as a historian, when I look at what Islam offered to the region, it offered something really beautiful. Yeah. It can do that again. The question comes down to, do we want to be those agents of change? If we want to do that, we need to imagine it and we need to believe it, for sure. Dr. Yaqub Ahmed, Jazakallah very much for your time today. I hope there is, there's a, a number of 18-year-olds who will take uh, counsel from your wisdom today and inshallah ta'ala make this ummah a, a better ummah uh, for it. Jazakallah khair. Thank you very much for your time inshallah. today. Thank you very much, bro. Assalamu alaikum. Please remember to subscribe to our social media and YouTube channels and head over to our website thinkinmuslim.com to sign up to my weekly newsletter. Jazakallah khair.